We talk a little bit about the technical stuff around here with the mechanical system. So you can see we're still in the punch list phase. We've got some holes poked around and we don't have these walls up here yet. So the idea with this front part of the house is that this would kind of be the living room um, and the TV goes there. It's going to mount above where the, um, the outlets are and that this uh, opening here can close off so that this can be used as a guest room. That's actually a fold out couch. So we designed a, a three track door so these three panels can stack out of the way here, which is going to be most of the time. But then if you have a guest, you can just sort of slide them this way and create a private room. Um, that's also going to be a three panel closure for the mechanicals, but we left it off. We haven't, I said, you know, we'll be showing the mechanicals to everybody anyway. So the way this house works, it's all electric. There's no gas for a furnace. The cooktop, if you saw in there, that's an uh, electric induction cooktop. So um, when you have all electric house, you have to be careful about how you use electricity for your, you know, drying your clothes, um, heating water, heating your house. Because if you use just regular electric resistance, it's really energy intensive. So we use a heat pump system for most of that. Um, there's a little heat pump out in the side yard. It looks like your air conditioner condenser kind of. It's a Mitsubishi system and it drives two pieces of equipment. This fan unit here that does heating and cooling and that little mini split ductless head right there. there uh, the ductless head is off. We're, we're just letting natural ventilation do the house for right now. Um, so that gives us our heating and cooling by ducting up to the bedrooms. And then this, I call the lungs of the house. It's an energy recovery ventilator. So we try to build our houses as airtight as we can because that controls the air and it keeps the air quality good if you ventilate. So this is how we get the fresh air in. And basically what's happening is we have returns or exhaust points from our places where we make humidity and, and smells, you know, like bathroom, kitchen, laundry. And that comes through here and it goes through this thing, which is called a counterflow heat exchanger and out the side of the house. And then it brings fresh air in, comes across that and it gets delivered right into our, um, right into our mechanical system here and then the fan distributes it throughout the house. So normally what happens with, um, with ventilation is, you know, what do you do in your house right now if you don't have one of these? You might have a, a fan over your cooktop, but if you're in a bedroom or something, you don't have any fan, you open a window. If it's zero degrees outside, you're not going to open a window. So air quality tends to go down even in uh, houses that aren't airtight because when the air is coming in, it's bringing in dust, it can bring contaminants, there can be mold if there's condensation issues. So, um, so this is the way to do it. We do this on all our new, uh, all our new buildings. Energy so in terms of the cost, like the way someone regularly heats and cools their houses for this type of square footage, like, mm -hmm. is it, how, how does the cost? Yeah, if we, just, if we just did a regular gas furnace, it Not would- Not the cost to build, but the cost to actually supply the- the energy? Uh -huh. Your bill. Like oh, that's a good question. Is it, cheap? Um, is it less expensive? Is it more expensive? It, generally, what? electricity is, is a little more expensive than gas. But these are a heat pump. And so what that means is that for every kilowatt of energy coming in, it can deliver, depending on the outdoor temperature, up to three times the heat for every kilowatt for every kilowatt of energy input, you can get three kilowatts of heat output, if that makes sense. So um, when the temperature gets like zero degrees Fahrenheit or 15 below, that drops down, that efficiency drops down. So at that point, you're paying a little more than you would pay for gas for the, electric, for the electricity to heat your house. But when it's 40 degrees outside, you're paying less. You see what I mean? So over the course of the winter, it's it's pretty comparable, but the other big aspect is, I believe it's pretty comparable. I really would need to back that up with some research. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the other big thing is like, how much are you insulating the walls? How much do you need that to kick on? And that's the whole passive idea, is that the more we insulate the walls, the better windows we put in, the more airtight it is, the less energy we need to put into the house. It's like, do you want to um, put your coffee into a glass carafe? or a thermal craft and not have to use heat to keep it warm, you know? So, so these are thermal crafts. <laughs> well, we're, we're in the uh, 
considerations on solar, being that this is all electric? Yes, absolutely. Good question. Our certification um, program that we're using here is the Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Home Program. So to be zero energy over the course of the year, you have to make as much energy as you use. So the idea is that we designed the south face of the roof to be big enough to hold enough solar panels to offset our annual energy use. And so that, the solar isn't on yet, but there's a, there's a conduit going up there to be ready for it. And the way it works is you, you, you hook the solar system, solar panel energy to an inverter that feeds the energy into your, your electric meter, uh, into your electric panel. And so if you're using it in the house, it just comes straight into your house. If you're not using a lot in the house, like on a day like this when we're using very little energy, it would be going out into the grid. So you're exporting energy and ComEd will buy it back from you a certain amount. Is it pretty easy to do the solar ready design or does it, I mean, it seems like it's something simple every home could be doing. Oh, yes, it is. I mean, really, it's just a, a you need to make sure that the roof is strong enough to hold the panels, but the panels are not terribly heavy. You need to get a, a conduit up there, and then the conduit needs to come down by the electric meter in the basement, and you got to mount an inverter. Yeah, and now the Illinois has passed the Future Energy Jobs Act that there are more incentives for solar, so it's a great time to uh, look for it. So, I mean, uh, <clears throat> you may not know this, because you're on the spot, but uh, to outfit a house of 2,000 square feet, so, so solar, would, would, you, would you approximate the cost to retrofit? Yeah, houses? generally people will say um, they'll give you a cost range of like three and a half to four dollars a watt or something like that, right? So <clears throat> if I say um, 24 panels, that's what we're thinking about here, at about 300 watts a panel, that's 7,200 watts, and if that's what would you say, 350, 375 a watt? Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, let's say 350 a watt. That's $25,000 retail price for this system. But I get a 30% federal tax credit and a 30% rebate from the state of Illinois. I think it's 30%. So that $25,000 turns into like $10,000 and I have zero energy, you know, for a house like this. Now. 24 panels might not quite get me there. I need to double check the calculation, but, but that's a pretty good sized system for a really energy efficient house. So you're talking probably in the neighborhood of 16 grand? 10, 12, I say 12 for a house of this size. <laughs> but, but, but you don't, I mean, you look at the, at the payback period and it's really pretty quick. And the question is what are electricity prices gonna do in the next Five, ten years. Yeah. So um, let's keep talking and we'll go upstairs. Okay. This is the water heater for the house and it's a heat pump water heater. So remember it's all electric house. Um, and so with electricity, if you use a standard resistance water heater, you use a ton of energy, like three times more than this. Um, so this being a water heater or being a heat pump takes, takes heat out of the air and basically puts it into the water. Um, now there's a new generation of these that's just come out that has outdoor units so that it isn't cooling down the house inside in the wintertime because that's the only real drawback. If she's sitting here doing art in December and this thing is running because somebody's taking a shower and it's cooling the air down, that cold air is going to fall and her feet will be cold. Mm. So with the outdoor unit, you have all that heat stuff going on outside. So, um, Would you but, be using those in your new projects, you think? Yeah, yeah, we're starting to spec those. They're pricier, but um, it's either that or if we have a mechanical system in a closet or in a basement somewhere, it's far enough away that people aren't really <coughs> using it. Um, but we definitely let people know that that's kind of how they work. Um, the, a lot of the houses we're doing are smaller, and so issues like this are really something we have to think about, you know, where you have equipment that makes noise, or makes makes heat or cold or humidity. Uh, the smaller the house, the more that becomes something to contend with. Did you explore um, uh, tankless on-demand hot water? We didn't. We've looked at it in the past, but with a house that's got this much distribution, then you have an issue, which is getting it there. And that's the other thing I wanted to point out. Um, 
So normally, if this is a tankless system, let's say, you'd turn on the hot water in the master, if it was a single tankless, and you'd have to get that hot water up to that master. And so first it would heat it up, then take a little water while the wire, water's running, take a little while, and then um, it's got to get all the way up there. And so the better way to conserve water and energy at the same time is to put one of these in, which is a recirculating pump. So the way this layout works is we've got a, a line that runs within five feet of any hot water fixture. And um, that means that if, if the hot water has been run through the line, then you'll have hot water in five seconds or less than a cup, I think it is. And that's a DOE guideline and recommendation. Now the way it works is you get up in the morning and it hasn't been running all night. So that is activated by a wireless switch. It looks like a little doorbell. So you get up in the morning, hit it, and it circulates, and then you've got the water right then. So it's a really nice for kind of a creature comfort side of things at the same time as, as conserving a lot of water and energy. So the tankless, if you really want to do it and make it effective, you need to have it close to the place, point of use, as far as, as far as I know. Would well, you agree about that? One. I'm just trying to picture, <clears throat> at a certain point, we had to replace our hot water heater, and State of Illinois, you get all kinds of rebates for not having all this water sitting in your house. Yeah. But I think, but the whole plumbing <clears throat> system was, of course, in place already because we had an old-fashioned hot water heater. And I do think it pretty much is under the kitchen sink under the bathroom. Yeah. So it is pretty much yeah. a straight up and down situation. Yeah. And that's where a traditional house tends to be a single plumbing stack, everything very centralized, because they were plumbing everything with cast iron. It was right. really hard. Now that we have PVC, we can just throw things anywhere. And that was a debate about the location of the stair and, and you know, that pushed the master bath to the far back side of the house. But we knew with this system we wouldn't be wasting much hot water.